findings from newly released research reveal that sex trafficking continues to make up most of both reported cases and prosecutions of trafficking in persons. The research was conducted from 2020 to 2022, making use of media reporting, information from NGOs, as well as police statistics and ongoing sex trafficking prosecutions. The report made mention of a consumer-level demand for commercial sex. This is evident in potentially thousands of sex buyers who use the services of adult and child victims of sex trafficking. It goes on to say that despite adequate laws, sex buyers continue to exploit women and children with impunity. Let's unpack the findings further with the author of the study, Dr. Marcel van der Vat, who is also a research fellow at the University of the Free State's Center for Human Rights. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. van der Vat, for your time this evening. So, uh, firstly, uh, what insights provided uh, by this report into the prevalence of the trafficking in persons in South Africa. Um, and can you tell us about contradictory reports of how frequently it does occur? Because some, some media interviews would suggest that, oh, well, it's, it's not really that prevalent. However, this research says otherwise, correct? Yeah, so true, Annie. And I think we need to go back to the original sources. Where, where, where does that claims come about that this is not a problem and uh, and you're right that started just before the world cup there was a first big study calling for the full decriminalization of the sex industry and that study in cape town found well trafficking is not a, a problem um four years or six years later that study in another study was consolidated and this very generalized claim were made that uh sex trafficking was created as this uh, panic uh, because of our international obligations. And the problem with, with that is, was exposed subsequently, is that wrong definitions were used, uh, practitioners were not consulted, instead, you know, people in prostitution were interviewed, and brothel keepers, you know, was interviewed um, for this research. And then subsequently, two years ago, another study by the Center for Child Law uh, claimed that human trafficking is hardly encountered sex trafficking is this you know there's little evidence of that and that report made its way into the constitutional court of south africa presented on a concern raised by judge muhueng muhueng about the, the issue of human trafficking in the country so ideological research huge problems huge implications for people that continue to be undercounted as victims of trafficking in south africa hmm. For, for viewers who, who might not come across uh, this kind of detailed research mm. uh, on a daily basis, can you tell us about the different types of trafficking and why sex trafficking uh, is so prevalent? Yeah. Well, well, I think, you know, sex trafficking is only one of many forms of trafficking, right? I mean, I, I would argue that labor trafficking eclipses that of sex trafficking. However, you know, reporting systems are just simply not in place to identify that. Um, so, so there's a huge research crevice. This study was done during the COVID-19 period when it was simply not possible to go out there on the streets and, and into the communities. So, um, but, but you're right, labor trafficking, we have uh, successful prosecutions on uh, the selling of babies, uh, adoption-related uh, uh, claims and trafficking. Mama Jackie, that was convicted uh, in, uh, in Tembisa, operated for many years um, under the facade of this uh, orphan each adoption agency. So I think at the end, at the, at the nucleus of this, Annie, it's, it's extreme and acute vulnerabilities, right? And I think that is where traffickers, pimps, and people come in, and they exploit that, you know? So any manner or form of exploitation could be the end product of a situation of human trafficking. Hmm. I was quite interested to, to find out that South Africa is not just a source country for trafficking or a transit country for trafficking, but also a destination for trafficked persons. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more? Because I would think that, you know, of course, the, the, the socioeconomic challenges we face would, would make uh, for easy pickings in terms of victims to be trafficked out of the country. But why are so many people being trafficked into the country? Well, you touched on the issue of consumer level demand. There's a demand for for people, nationalities, shapes and sizes, uh, even disabilities, 
you know, in, in trafficking, the sex trade, labor, etc. And I just want to make this point very, very clear, Annie. This is the, the fact that we to this day, to this day, still wonder is human trafficking a problem is mind boggling. We know the history pre-94 trafficking has been documented as early as well, going back to the to the media in 1990s and the mid 1990s already. We had studies uh, of, of children as young as eight and 10 being exploited and trafficked in brothels in Cape Town. Yet, we didn't have a trafficking definition yet. So over the years, we have cases being subsumed under other crimes. But I think in terms of a destination, I mean, Thailand, we, you know, I mean, there's a host of countries. We've got nationalities, victim nationalities from several countries, as well as perpetrator nationalities. And I think South Africa and the systems here work. I mean, financial systems, porous borders. Uh, corruption is a significant problem as an enabler and a perpetuator of human trafficking. So this, it, you know, it's the ideal location to uh, to perpetrate and um, yeah, go into this business. If you say it's, it's mind boggling that we still wonder whether this is in fact a problem, quantify that for us. I know it's very difficult to give us, you know, yep. figures because of the under reporting, but, but based on yep. uh, research and on prosecutions, the cases that find themselves in the criminal justice system, what kind of figures are we looking at? Great question. So the first point is our first interim piece of legislation was active on or about between 2007 and 2015. Now, in that point in time, there was really a lack of awareness in terms of the elements of the crime. And we had a few cases identified, almost like 300 in that period. And we know for a fact, tons of it was subsumed into abduction, rape, even domestic violence and civil disputes. So after 9 of August 2015, uh, there was a lot of awareness around what this is, and, and cases started to come in. So since then, uh, we had more than on, on the police CAS system, and the caveat there is this is definitely not accurate because a lot of it is undocumented and relies on, on police actions, but more than 11,000 cases of, of trafficking reported to the police since 2015. Um, and I think what is so important to remember here, Annie, is that uh, you know, those 11,000 plus cases are cases. That's not an indication in terms of how many victims there are in each case. The Hawks dealt with 91 cases at their nodal point. In that 91 cases, there was more than 600 victims of trafficking. Speculatively, the question, how many, if there's so many in 91, uh, how many victims are there in the 11,000 plus? So we know also that Becky, uh, Minister Becky clearly uh, announced on a question from Parliament's Liesl van der Maat, a great question, asking how many South African children were trafficked between the period of 2018 and 2021. He came up with a number of uh, 781, and I would argue that's also gross undercount. And then we can go into successful prosecutions. We've got that data, and that also paints a uncertain picture. Let's talk about the work done being by trafficking task teams in South Africa. Um, how on top of this are we not only in terms of identifying uh, the crimes, but also in terms of prosecuting the crimes, in terms of assisting the victims? Because ultimately, you know, the focus should be on what are the most likely outcomes for the victims. Yeah, I want to preface that my answer with the following is incredible prosecutors police investigators, social workers, government officials that's working in the space, doing phenomenal work. Now, we are currently, for the fourth year out of five years, we are on the tier two watch list of the U.S. State Department trafficking in persons report and that, that framework. And, um, and if you just look at the 11,000 plus cases, how many of those were six who came out the other end of the criminal justice system? Only 44, Annie. Uh, and that still is only the tip of the iceberg, the 11,000 plus. We know several victims don't know that they are victims. There's indifference and they fall through massive crevices in South African society. Um, so we are failing on, on several fronts. We've been warned as a country by the, by the international community and the tip report, go after consumer level demand for forced labor and commercial sex, and we simply ignore that. And we can draw some inferences now in terms of why that is the case. I would assume that women and children form the most vulnerable group to be trafficked. 
but one doesn't want to create perceptions of, oh, well, you know, I don't fall in that category. I'm an adult, I'm a male, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm not at risk. Tell us yeah. who, who we should be the most worried about, because parents are most worried about their children. Women generally are most worried about themselves because, you know, women are, fall prey to so many crimes. Who are the most yeah. often trafficked people? Yeah. Well, again, vulnerability, any form of vulnerability is kind of the golden thread. But, I mean, we see women, children, the LGBTQ community is vulnerable. Undocumented migrants are extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And, again, there's this critique around the issue of trafficking. Well, don't conflate trafficking with other issues, people on the move and, you know, the uh, prostitution, etc. The fact is we've got a very, very clear piece of legislation. It's unequivocal what trafficking is and what it's not. Vulnerable commu communities, uh, Annie, is all around us, right? And I think, so there's no specific profile. I think when we read these court judgments and you analyze the transcripts, hours and hours of testimony, I've testified in several of these matters over the years. It is incredible how acutely vulnerable people are. Drug addiction, uh, addiction um, you know, there's, there's a full range of issues. Social, well, the definition talks about social circumstances, financial circumstances, being a child, being pregnant, being undocumented and being addicted to drugs. Those are the predispositions that is actually cemented in the act. And that gives you an idea in terms of who those communities are. But all of us can be vulnerable to trafficking. When you consider the inextricable link between prostitution and sex trafficking, what are your thoughts on government's efforts to decriminalize the sex trade? So, yeah, I'm putting on my private hat. I've, you know, I've been in this space for 20 years. I've worked as a police official. I've done interviews after interviews, undercover and as a researcher, with implicated brothel owners, sex traffickers. I would argue that unthinkable harm awaits women, children, vulnerable communities, neighborhoods, should this trajectory take its course, Annie. I cannot overstate that. What the government is proposing is building on ramps into a vortex of violence instead of building off ramps out of it. So over these years, I've worked with countless women trapped in the system of prostitution. And honestly, all those that I've worked with and even my colleagues, they would choose any day if a viable alternative is offered. And, um, and this is going to spill over in communities. Remember, this is full decriminalization, right? So pop up brothels is something we might see very soon after this comes into play. The sexual uh, offenses registry, I mean, brothel owners could be teaching school children uh, we know government officials people they've got the side hustles what would that be the go-to would be probably brothels you know so so i've i've got a major major concern issues of organized crime drug dealing it's inextricably linked to the sex trade in south africa and globally the research is overwhelming no, nowhere in the world do you get a sex trade that does not have the fingerprints, the footprints, and the DNA of human trafficking in it. You can do whatever you want, but you're not going to create that clinical break between the two. They seamlessly intersperse. Hmm. Just for our viewers, last quick question before I let you go. Because it's such an underreported and very you know, badly understood issue um, in broader society, we tend to sort of look the other way and go, oh, well, shucks, that's, that's, that's not likely to touch my life. But if you say the vulnerable communities are all around us, it's everybody's uh, responsibility to know more about trafficking. What are some of the best resources for ordinary South Africans to, to read or watch to find information about the situation in South Africa? Yeah, I think, firstly, be very careful that you do not spread misinformation. We've already got enough misinformation from the research community, some of those in the research community. There's amazing research studies out there. But the number to remember it should be on everybody's dial list is 0800 222 777. That's the National Human Trafficking Resource Number. Follow them on Twitter. Connect with the National Freedom Network. And, um, and yeah, I think always be careful. I'm going to use an African proverb. Be careful of the naked man who offers you clothes. And remember that the death of a lion is not announced by a goat. Be very, very careful. Political parties, government, South African society, be very careful where you get your information. So thank you for ending on that note, Annie.
Thank you so much uh, for speaking to us. That was Dr. Marcel van der Vat, Research Fellow at the University of the Free States Center for Human Rights, giving us some very alarming information uh, about human trafficking in South Africa.